Good morning. My name is Jonathan Withy, and I'm the Director of Transformation in ESG at PlanetMark. And I'm here today to talk to you about two things. The first is how we can help more people understand the urgency for action in solving the climate crisis. And the second is, once we all understand that urgency for action, how we can harness our resulting climate anxieties to drive positive transformational change. Now, it was 15 years since I first understood the urgency of action in solving the climate crisis. I can remember the day really clearly. It was a damp and grey Wednesday morning at the University of Leeds. I was sat in a large lecture theatre amongst my friends, feeling slightly delicate from the night before and proud of myself for making a 9am lecture. Now, I was in my first year of studying for a BSc in Geography, and in amongst all the colouring in, my favourite subject was paleoclimates, which is the study of varying patterns of weather throughout the Earth's 4.5 billion year history. Our lecturer at the time showed us this graph, which if I click, which is the first time I saw varying levels of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere over the last 800,000 years. It's actually a really small snapshot in the Earth's history. And I get the privilege to get out this laser pointer to show you that at the troughs of this graph, these actually represent ice ages or glacial periods when it was super cold. And at the peaks of this graph, these actually represent interglacial periods where the climate was very similar to how it is today. These peaks and troughs um, stretch back over the last 2.6 million years, where we've actually experienced quite extremely different climatic conditions. This is known as the Quaternary Period. Now, if we focus in for a moment on the last 10,000 years, which is this little bit here, this was 10,000 years ago was actually the birth of agriculture, which is a period which we call the Holocene. It's a period where the climate was, has been super stable, so stable that we've been able to predict the seasons so that we could grow crops such as wheat and domesticate livestock, allowing us to move from hunter-gatherers to settling down in one place. And without this stable climate, we would not have been able to develop to where we are today. Now, you may well have noticed this large spike in carbon dioxide at the right-hand side of this graph entering our atmosphere. This actually started about 150 years ago, in line with the start of the Industrial Revolution, where we got really, really good at extracting and burning fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and natural gas releasing significant quantities of carbon dioxide into our, our atmosphere over a really, really short space of time. Now, to understand the correlation between this massive great big spike in carbon and a warming and destabilizing climate, I'm going to give you a very brief whistle-stop tour of my favorite explanation of how climate change works. Now, I want you to imagine the Earth. And I want you to imagine above the Earth is wrapped completely in a layer of cling film. This cling film is going to represent our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is made up of lots of gases, things like carbon dioxide, as you can see on the graph, oxygen, nitrogen, argon, methane, might surprise you, water vapor, and a few others. And I want you to imagine this cling film, there is our atmosphere, they have lots of tiny holes in it. And these holes are representing the gaps in the atmosphere as our gases move around. Now our sun is constantly emitting heat down onto the Earth. Some of this through this cling film, some of this heat hits the Earth and is absorbed, and some of it is reflected back up into the cling film, where it either passes back out through these small gaps in the cling film, out into space, or it hits the cling film and is trapped there, causing the Earth to warm. And without this cling film that is our atmosphere, we wouldn't have the warm climate that we have today, 
And actually, the Earth would just be a much larger version of the Moon, so it's super important. Now, back to the rapid release of carbon. This rapid release of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere, the carbon dioxide is starting to plug some of these holes in our cling film, trapping more and more heat, which is causing our air and oceans to increasingly warm. Now, the crux of why we call this a climate crisis is because the warming of our air and oceans is causing our seasons to become more unpredictable and is causing the increasing frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, which is going to threaten our ability to have access to the fresh drinking water, food, and shelter that we need. And in areas of the world where these extreme weather phenomena and resulting droughts, floods, and wildfires become so, so extreme that these places become unlivable, we're going to see mass movements of people, which is going to increase our geopolitical pressures. Now, if I take you back to 19-year-old me, and I first saw this graph, I actually thought, right, if these trough things mean ice ages, I'm very worried about what this big spike in carbon up the other end of it means. This was when I first started having my climate anxieties. And I managed to harness those anxieties to go on to do an MSc in business, climate, and sustainability, work for the UN Environment Programme out in the Philippines, and work fairly tirelessly to create business cases for both SMEs and large corporate organizations to be measuring and reducing the carbon emissions associated with activities as quickly as they possibly can. Now, the hopefully more positive and uplifting part of this talk is to focus on the solutions. Solutions in which we stabilize the climate and prevent it from warming any further. Solutions where we stop emitting carbon associated with our activities into the atmosphere. And solutions where we actually start to take carbon out of the atmosphere, all of the carbon that we have historically emitted. This is the positive transformational change that we need to see. The good news is, we still have control of our climate destiny, and we've got a pretty good idea of the solutions we need to develop and scale in order to navigate this crisis. Now, the aim of the game is to stop the climate warming no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. To put this into context, we've already warmed roughly 1.2 degrees C Celsius. We don't have much room to play with. Now, nearly every country in the world has made public commitments to contribute to this cap on globally warming temperatures. This was a momentous occasion in Paris in 2015 at one of the UN Global COP climate summits. I'm sure you can agree, getting every country in the world to agree to something is tricky business. Now, from this summit, one of the things that was born was this term net zero. And net zero has risen to prominence as the leading approach for countries and organizations to take in playing their part in solving the climate crisis. And net zero works in a couple of ways. In order for a country or organization to achieve net zero status, they first have to measure all of the carbon emissions being emitted associated with their activities. These are carbon emissions associated with things like the energy that they consume, carbon emissions associated with how they travel, what they buy, what they sell, amongst other things. Once you've measured all of that over a year period, you then have to reduce that carbon footprint every year as much as you can by at least 90% by the year 2050 or before, with an interim target of a 50% reduction by 2030. Now, the remaining up to 10% of what we call residual emissions, which is the net in net zero, these can be offset through credible carbon removal schemes that actively take carbon, sequester carbon from the atmosphere. And these are done in two ways, either natural carbon sinks, such as afforestation, peatland restoration, and my personal favorite, seagrass restoration, or carbon capture and storage technologies, where essentially great big machines 
extract carbon from the air and store it deep underground or in things like concrete. Now, you may have heard of some of these other terms, like carbon neutral, climate positive, or carbon negative. In order to be carbon neutral, you typically have to do four things. The first is you need to measure the carbon emissions associated with your direct activities, not necessarily measure all of your carbon emissions, and that's quite important. The second thing you need to do is make a commitment to reduce those carbon emissions every year. The third thing you need is a documented carbon management plan to show how you're going to meet those reductions. And the fourth thing is you offset those emissions that you've measured every year. Now, to achieve carbon neutrality is actually fairly easy. And I view carbon neutrality as a stepping stone to net zero. Carbon neutrality on its own will not solve the climate crisis. Then you've got these other terms, such as carbon negative and climate positive. To be frank, these terms have been created by large corporate communication teams to sound better than others. And typically, they mean you're just offsetting more of the carbon than you're measuring. Net zero is the aim of the game here. Net zero is a long-term transformational journey. And it's what we must all focus on in order to solve the climate crisis. So now you understand a little bit more about why we're in a climate crisis and the urgency we need to do to act to solve it. And you also understand a little bit about the solutions and the direction of travel we need to take in order to navigate it. The final part of my talk, I want to highlight that I passionately believe in significant moments in time that can really drive the positive transformation that we need to see. Let me give you an example. It was 2019. I just started a new job at a carbon footprinting company called Planet Mark. And it was my sole purpose to demonstrate to organizations that it was both easy and profitable for them to measure and reduce their carbon on a continual basis as robustly and efficiently as they possibly could. And what really helped my conversations was a collective moment of three things. The first was Greta Thunberg, the second was the school strike for climate, and the third was Extinction Rebellion. The increased societal expectation on companies and countries to do more, driven by the passion of these young people in harnessing their climate anxieties, tangibly drove the agenda forward. And we saw much, much more action taking place as a result. Ultimately, however, we are not doing enough. And global carbon emissions continue to rise every year. Now, one of my personal values is courage. And in the face of what is going to be the greatest transformational challenge we have ever faced, we're going to need plenty of courage. We don't really like change. But rapid change is coming whether we like it or not. And we have to ensure it's the right kind of change. Change that ensures we have access to the fresh drinking water, food, shelter, and purpose to strive to meet and exceed our potential as a species long into the future. Now, what I challenge you to do with this newfound knowledge I've just imparted upon you is to talk about the climate crisis. Talk about it with your friends, colleagues, and families. Now, this will be difficult. It is a tricky subject, but we cannot let this critical issue be lost with everything else that is going on around us. Now, I'm going to leave you with a quote from one of the greatest allies we have in driving positive change, and that is Sir David Attenborough. He says, humans are great problem solvers. We need to imagine a better future and work to create it. Thank you.